uh, in the last three modules we have discussed femtosecond uh, upconversion uh, spectroscopy, femtosecond fluorescence upconversion or femtosecond optical gating fog. Today we have come to the lab and we are going to show you an actual fog spectrometer and you will see how the data is recorded. But before we do that let us recapitulate what we have done in the class. I will first show you a diagram of the system then we will go to the instrument right. So, you might remember that this is the layout of our optical unit for the fog spectrometer. The spectrometer we use in our lab has the name fog 100 it is from a company called CDP corporation which is based in Russia. So, just to remind you what we have here is that we have red light nominally 800 nanometer, but in our case tunable from 690 nanometer all the way to 950 nanometer from a femtosecond pulsed titanium sapphire laser. Later on in this course we are going to open up the laser that is used as a light source for this instrument and we will show you what is in there, but let that be the story for another day and let us wait until we discuss uh, the operation of a titanium sapphire laser in class before we come back and show you the laser. For today we just take the laser as a light source 100 femtosecond pulses 80 megahertz deputation rate. This light source passes through an aperture and is focused by this lens L 1 onto a nonlinear crystal N C 1. Here we typically use a beta barium borate BBO crystal and by focusing the uh, red light onto the nonlinear crystal 1 second harmonic generation takes place and you generate blue light. Now, in this region you have red and blue light that is that are mixed together. Since you focused you are going to have a diverging beam here the diverging beam is captured by another lens L 2 which is placed in such a way that the focus of L 2 is at uh, N C 1. Then the mixture of red and blue light goes and hits a beam splitter B S 1. Here red light goes through and blue light gets reflected through something called a Beric wave plate that we are going to show you. The blue light goes and hits another beam splitter through which any residual red light is dumped and the light blue light itself is uh, reflected. This light is focused by another lens L 3 onto the sample and as you are going to see the sample that we use is mostly liquid sample which we rotate all the time so that it is not destroyed by these uh, femtosecond pulses. We are also going to learn later on how much energy per pulse is there. Then from the sample fluorescence is collected by another lens goes through a uh, long pass filter F 3 which blocks the excitation blue light, but passes the fluorescence light. Now, this fluorescence light is focused by a lens L 4 onto another nonlinear crystal which we called N C 2 or as we have discussed in class the some frequency generation crystal. So, this is one part of the story. The other part of the story is that the red light that passes through B S 1 hits a mirror M 2 another mirror M 3 and then gets retro reflected to a mirror M 4 to M 5 from M 5 it is focused by the same same lens as the one that is used to focus fluorescence light onto the same uh, nonlinear crystal N C 2. So, here what you have is a some frequency generation you remember this is called gate light the red light let us say that has omega uh, 2 frequency let us say omega 1 is the frequency of uh, the uh, fluorescence I do not exactly remember whether you use omega 1 or omega 2, but I think you can understand. So, what happens here is that omega 1 plus omega 2 some frequency generation takes place and it is this some frequency that is made to go through another uh, filter which in this case is a short pass filter passes only U V and we have calculated in class uh, how U V is generated here and this U V goes to a monochromator and then to a detector. So, the way it works is that this retro reflector is mounted on an optical delay optical delay is essentially a one foot long screw which is moved. So, the screw is moved to a particular position then intensity of some frequency is recorded then it is moved to another position intensity of some frequency is recorded 
and this is how the entire map of fluorescence decay is generated by plotting intensity of some frequency against the uh, delay time. And as you might remember uh, we had said that since the intensity of the gate pulse is uh, constant and intensity of fluorescence falls off with time intensity of the uh, some frequency its product of intensities of omega 1 and omega 2 the intensity of some frequency actually provides a measure of intensity of fluorescence light because the intensity of gate light is constant. So, when we plot that against delay time we generate the fluorescence decay with femtosecond time resolution and while ca calculating this time resolution I had goofed up a little bit because I had taken frequency or the uh, uh, velocity of light to be uh, 3 into 10 to the power 10 meters per second actually it is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meters per second. So, crux of the matter is if you move the screw in with microsecond uh, resolution then you can obtain uh, time resolution in femtoseconds. So, that is a recap that we wanted to provide. Now, let us go and see the spectrometer all right. This is the optical table on which our uh, femtosecond optical gating experiment is done. This here is the femtosecond laser uh, in our case it is a tsunami laser uh, from uh, Newport it is quite old. Uh, the other laser that we have not shown you yet I think uh, is uh, much compact, but what tsunami uh, does is that it provides 800 nanometer light with 100 femtosecond pulses at 80 megahertz repetition rate. So, that light you can hardly see it, it comes here hits this mirror comes here goes through this optical unit which we are not going to discuss because we are not talking about third harmonic generation from there it goes into the spectrometer this is the spectrometer fog 100 where the experiment is actually done and for your benefit what I will do is I will remove all this so that you can see a little better ok. Right. This here is the optical unit remember uh, where laser light is supposed to come from it is supposed to come from uh, this direction. Now, let me show you the red light if you can see it you see that red spot of light that is the output of the titanium sapphire laser to your eye it seems that it is uh, a light that is always on, but actually it is not we have hundreds of second pulses there and the pulses are coming at a repetition rate of 76 megahertz too fast for our eyes to make out the pulses from each other that is why it looks like continuous wave. So, this comes here this is the lens that ok for dramatic effect let me do something else let, let me block this or maybe not this is the lens that focuses it onto yeah that is better focuses it onto this nonlinear crystal and you can already see some blue light coming out from here right. As you see the intensity of blue light is something that depends on how I turn the crystal you see the blue light got brighter and if I turn the other way it is going to get dimmer and dimmer. So, these crystals are angle tuned as we are going to study perhaps later on you can actually uh, change the angle of the crystal by using this micrometer screw head and that is what is going to uh, affect the efficiency with which second harmonic is generated. Now, this light you can only see blue light here because it is so bright and our eyes do not see red light all that well. So, this blue, but, but actually it is a mixture of red and blue. So, that comes here onto the beam splitter, this is the beam splitter. So, if I hold the card here, you can see the red beam once again. That is because the beam splitter has reflected most of the blue light and has transmitted the red light. I have always been talking about the blue path first. So, for a change, let me talk about the uh, red path to start with. So, remember this is the gate light the red light it hits the mirror m 2 m 3 and goes straight this here is the retro reflector you can see the spot here this is the retro reflector and this thing that you see and you will see it better when we turn the lights on this is the retro reflector remember and it is mounted on a 1 foot long screw you cannot see the screw because it is inside when we show you pump probe later on you will actually be able to see it and what this retro reflector does is that this retro reflector can move uh, all the way from here to here we will just move it once and show you 
you see uh, this is computer control uh, your T A just click the mouse and now you see the retro reflector is moving back and as you understand while it moves back this red light here is undergoing a longer path. So, this is how we can actually change the path length of the red, red light which as you know by now is called the gate light. So, right now we are going continually just to show you, but actually we go in steps we go step by step and then we stop at every step and that is where the measurement is made. Okay. So, you have seen the screw now let us get back to the demonstration of the light path. We have taken the retro reflector back here this is the incoming beam and the outgoing beam comes from here onto this mirror. I think you can see the spot on the card here. So, it hits this mirror here this mirror if you remember is called M 4 this is M 2 this is M 3 this is the retro reflector R this is M 4 from M 4 it comes to this mirror M 5 and from M 5 it goes to this lens which focuses it onto this crystal this crystal is the NC 2 crystal the second nonlinear crystal let us turn on the light so that you see the components once. So, to repeat this one is M 2 M 3 retro reflector R M 4 M 5 this is a lens L 4 which focuses the beam onto this nonlinear crystal N C 2 and from there the output is collected by this lens here this lens is L 5 go straight you see this is opened all the way this piece of optic here is a short pass filter it allows UV light to go through, but not uh, visible light. So, uh, you understand this is the path of this some frequency as well as we will show you this here is the monochromator as I told you this is an old machine. So, it has developed some light leak. So, you have covered it with uh, black cloth and this is what contains the photomultiplier detector. So, what we have showed you now is the path of the gate light. Now, let us talk about fluorescent light. I will show you the path first while the light is on then we will switch the light off and show you the light uh, well uh, the show you the fluorescence. So, now remember this is beam splitter red light has gone through and blue light has been reflected in the path of blue light we use these pieces of optics which are called neutral density filter. The reason why we use them is that you do not want to put too much of sample on uh, too much of light on your sample anyway it will uh, get destroyed. So, from there blue light comes in this thing you see is called Beric wave plate because as you remember you have to ma maintain magic angle polarization if you are wrong there your decays are not going to be correct. So, this is what uh, is used to measure polarize to maintain polarization this is a second beam splitter which reflects blue beam and transmits the red beam. The blue beam is collected by this lens inside this cylinder there is a lens and is focused on this sample. The sample we have is a liquid sample. So, what we have to do is we have to keep rotating it. So, that the laser light does not hit the same spot again and again because if it does then your sample is going to get spoiled. Fluorescence from there is collected by a lens kept inside this cylinder goes straight and passes through this filter which is a uh, long pass filter cuts out blue light and transmits fluorescence light. Then this fluorescence light falls on the lens L 4 you might remember L 4 from our previous discussion of path of the red light L 4 focuses the fluorescence light and remember as well as the gate light onto N C 2 the nonlinear crystal some frequency is generated here collected by the lens here go straight and we have discussed the detection part already. So, this these are the components. Uh, now, we are going to turn off the light and show you uh, the fluorescence as, and as well as the sum frequency right. Now, that the light is off you can see blue light once again can't you. So, blue light comes here remember gets collected by this lens and fo is focused onto the sample. The moment I remove this barrier you will see the fluorescence of the sample yourself and that is because right now we are using a standard sample which is very highly fluorescent there you go. So, the bright light that you can see 
is that of the fluorescence and from this side if you look you can actually see a spot that is brightest that spot is where the blue light is focused and that is why the fluorescence from that spot is what we are actually collecting the uh, everything else is a glow arising from there. Now, remember the path once again this fluorescence is collected by this lens goes straight if I put in my card here you can see blue light as well as the fluorescence. Now, we do not want blue light that is why it goes through this uh, long pass filter as we have discussed and after the filter if you put in the card you see now there is no blue light you see that you put it here you see a blue sharp spot almost at the center of the spot uh, that you see for fluorescence. When it goes through the long pass filter that long pass filter does not uh, transmit the uh, blue light anymore, but fluorescence goes through and here fluorescence looks like a big spot size of which is determined by the diameter of this lens. Then what happens it goes here and on this lens L 4 now you can see both you can see the sharp red light which is gate light and you can see the uh, fluorescence light as well as a big spot both are focused now. Now, if you see if I go more and more towards N C you can see the spots are coming together and they are becoming smaller they are becoming smaller because they are getting focused and they are focused on this nonlinear crystal. Now, what I have done is I have intentionally detuned the crystal here to show you what happens after the crystal ok. Let us go back once before the crystal you can see the gate light is towards me and the uh, blue light is away from me or from the direction in which, which you are looking red light is towards your red uh, towards your right and the fluorescence light is towards your left after the nonlinear crystal their directions have reversed because they have crossed here. So, uh, the in a perfect alignment they would have met exactly at the nonlinear crystal. Now, what I want to do is I want to generate some frequency to do that I have to angle tune this crystal and you will see some frequency coming out as blue light. Actually it is UV, but when it hits the uh, paper it looks blue yeah there you go. In fact, you can tell by eye by and large and but later you have to use the detector you see you see this sharp blue light coming out that is actually not blue it is UV, but UV light excites the collagen molecules in paper and that is what gives you uh, a blue color to your eyes. Now, it is this light that goes through here of course, you can see everything, but if I could put the card after the short pass filter you would see fluorescence is cut out gate light is cut out only this UV light which shows up as a bright blue light that is the only thing that goes through to the detector right. Now, we are going to acquire data you see our computer screen and there I will draw your attention to the panel on the uh, top left there you can see two readings on top you see something like 28998.84 femtosecond that is the delay that we have given to the gate light. It looks like a ridiculously long large number, but that is because we are writing it in femtosecond if you wrote it in picosecond it would not look as bad. Uh, but then the point is that we actually have this kind of accuracy that we can go to the second place of decimal of femtosecond and the bottom panel where you see a number that is fluctuating slowly you saw 350 now it is 373 a uh, little later it will be something else 415 that is the output of the photomultiplier tube and that number is uh, proportional to the intensity of uh, the sum frequency light and we are going to show you first uh, of course, you cannot see me now, but I will tell you what I am doing first of all I am going to block the fluorescence light. So, see right now count is something like 364 or something now I block the fluorescence light and immediately the count starts falling now it is 292 now it is 60. So, it is going to go to almost 0 and we are using a slow acquisition time that is why you still see some counts otherwise you will see nothing. So, the count becomes uh, uh, almost 0 when you block the fluorescence light that is one part of the story. Now, I have unblocked fluorescence light and you can see the count growing again after 2 or 3 readings since we are using a uh, 5 uh, picosecond into 5 uh, second integration time it takes a little bit of time, but we are back to where we started from 358 normally this count is much higher 
uh, right now our instrument is not in very good alignment normally this count would be something like 80,000 or so. Now, next I am going to block the red light. I have blocked the red light now and you will see this count falling once again. See it started falling already 294 from 300 something now it is 9. So, what does that mean? The signal goes when you block red light or you when you block fluorescence light. This is what confirms that it is actually some frequency signal because if you block one light and the signal does not go that means, it is some kind of a spurious signal. Next what we are going to do is we are going to record a decay which means we are going to change the delay and we are going to record the intensity of some frequency as a function of delay time. So, now see we are recording the data and uh, right now the time delay is such that we have not reached time 0. So, you might be able to see that the data is being recorded point by point and you can see some fluctuation in data that is the noise noise that we had talked about uh, the data you do not get the same uh, value for all measurements even when uh, the counts are actually close to 0. So, at time 0 what happens is there is a jump and uh, the decay uh, the signal goes up and it decays from there. Now, you see that there has been a jump which means that we are now close to time 0 and what was looking like signal to you a little earlier you can see now that it is actually nothing but baseline it is 0. Uh, you might be a little confused uh, by the way acquisition is being done here. Uh, the way this uh, program is written is that the x axis keeps changing and keeps getting expanded as you record. So, that is why uh, what looked like uh, full scale now is no longer full scale it is getting actually smaller and smaller. Now, we have reached time 0 and uh, that means that signal is actually there and you see that there is a jump. Now, you are going to see the decay of the signal and in fact, for the sample that we have it does not decay too much it actually has a uh, nanosecond lifetime, but uh, this whatever much it decays in our time of acquisition you are going to see it here. In fact, now that we have shown you time 0 what we will do is we will stop this acquisition and we will show you uh, a data that we have recorded previously uh, and you should be able to correlate that with this one right. So, this is uh, what you see here is uh, a decay that is recorded by the method that you saw uh, y axis is actually intensity of some frequency x axis is delay. So, this as we have said earlier is essentially a map of the fluorescence decay that uh, the sample has. So, uh, to conclude this discussion we have discussed in the lecture how uh, fluorescence up conversion technique gives you a femtosecond time resolution and here today we have given you some glimpses of how the experiment is actually done. So, the only thing that remains for you to is to go to a lab and do the experiment yourself. So, we conclude this part of the discussion now and uh, later on uh, after this we are going to uh, move on to a discussion of how lasers work because as you understand lasers are uh, the central tool for any uh, kind of ultrafast spectroscopy that we do and uh, once we are done with the discussion of the theory of lasers we will come back to this lab, we will open up the laser for you and we will show you what is there inside.